first, I want to uh, I want to thank uh, Claire for allowing me to do this presentation or twisting my arm to do this presentation, uh, whichever one works. Um, and thank President Nabil uh, for being here this morning. And I certainly spoke to some of uh, our students over the last couple of days uh, to help me uh, put this presentation together. And also, I saw Ozyman, there he is, uh, thank Ozyman for giving me some of the data uh, that I needed for this presentation. Um, secondly, I wanted to thank some of my colleagues um, who are here to assist me today uh, with the presentation and with our breakout sessions uh, from the MENT organization, African American Mental Education Network and Development Organization. Uh, our new dean, Dr. Walter Jones, uh, served as our new dean, but also, <laughs> also serves as the president of our organization. Uh, Dr. Gerald Foster, who sits next to him, is a dean of student services at Rio Hondo College and serves as president-elect and Mr. Morell Green, um, inside joke, I apologize, <laughs> uh, who is the counselor here on campus, serves as our executive board member for the organization. So today, the outline of this presentation, uh, what we want to talk about is some of the data uh, from a local level, uh, statewide, and also a national level. Um, talk about what is the disappearing student and what does that actually look like. Um, we want to talk about the literature, talk about what is student equity, um, what are our successes as a college, uh, and then lastly, we'll talk about the breakout sessions that are going to happen after the presentation, after the student panel, and then also I want to leave time for, for discussion after the presentation, so I'll try to get through the slides as rapidly as possible. So, um, the topic of today is, is what are we doing essentially to help African American students be successful here at West, since that seems to be a large population of our students here at West. So if we look at the background of the issue kind of broadly, what we find is that um, there tends to be a lack of effort uh, either on the student's part or the college's part, uh, designed to get students through through graduation. So what we know is that sometimes our students uh, typically are underrepresented, uh, they have a low rate of academic success, um, typically uh, experience some type of racism or discrimination on campus, broadly, not necessarily here at West, I want to make that uh, very clear. Um, have low persistence rates, uh, really struggle with the institutional climate, um, and then also have some identity development uh, issues that have to be addressed. So what I want to do now is is, the, is just to dive straight into the data, excuse me, straight into the data at the local level and look at our persistence rates at West. Um, and when we talk about persistence, really what we're talking about is from fall to fall. And what that data is telling you is that roughly 38% of our female, our African American females here at West persist from fall to fall. Um, about 41% of our males, but overall 39% persist from fall to fall. Um, if we look at our retention rates, um, we're looking at similar numbers, 38 percent of our, of our female students uh, persist, 41 percent of our males persist. Overall, we're looking at about 39 percent of our students persist um, here at, at West. And then when we look at our success rates, when we talk about success, we're talking about actual successful completion of the class A, B, or C. Um, and you see the data there in red, 54% of our women students uh, actually uh, complete courses here at the college. 55% of our males, and then 54% overall. Now, these numbers, they should be staggering, um, because obviously what we want to do as faculty and staff and administrators here at campus, on, on campus is to get students through from start to finish. 
However, if you look back in 2005, you see the data isn't that much different. Maybe five or six points higher than they are nine years later. And this data comes from, uh, from the data mark from the state chancellor's office. So the bigger question is, is this acceptable as professionals and also as students? Because students play a part in this also, right? Is this acceptable for students? And if not, how do we move forward? That's kind of a rhetorical question, but if you want to answer it. <laughs> so what I have here is an illustration of kind of what the disappearance field looks like. So let's say, for example, 10 students, 10 African-American students come to campus. Uh, and <laughs> right. um, so what you'll see is you have three of those students who would drop before the W date. You have two students who would drop after the W date. You have two students who will finish but won't come back to West for whatever the reason may be. And we're left with three students that are going to enroll in either the fall or spring of the next year. So graphically, this is kind of what it looks like uh, for us at West based on the data that we ascertained. However, there is good news. And the good news is, is that it's just not us, right? It's a national phenomenon. If you look at the data here, I know it's kind of small, but the numbers are similar. In the 30% of those students who actually attain some type of degree. Uh, and that's from the National Center of Educational uh, Statistics. Um, I have President Obama's picture there because he made an important point uh, in his last State of the Union. And he had mentioned this state and he said, we are the opportunity. And he was speaking specifically about community colleges. And I think we are the opportunity uh, because we educate most of, of the students in the nation at this point. If you look at the statewide data, uh, it tells the same thing for credit courses and, and, and degree applicable courses. Of course, the numbers are going to be higher because we're looking at a, a larger population of students up and down the course, up and, excuse me, up and down the state. You see the retention rate is higher, but that's because I can be a student at West this semester and a student at El Camino next semester, but I'm still in the overall data of the state. But we're still looking at, uh, in terms of retention and success rate, we're still looking at 58% success rate. I think that was about a million and a half students, uh, African American students that were, that were in, that, in that specific data set uh, that I looked at. More good news is that this isn't new. Uh, there's been several researchers who have, who, have, who have researched this specific instance. If we look at Vincent Tinto and, he look, and, and his research on academic integration, basically talking about a more engaged student is a student that's likely to stay at the college. Uh, Christian, uh, he talks about the importance of academic advice. Certainly academic advising is different at the four-year than it is at the two-year, but it's still academic advising. Um, Alexander Aston talked about involvement, involvement with clubs, involvement um, with different organizations on campus to keep the student engaged and on campus. Um, Cross, he talks about the black identity development. And really what he's talking about is how students struggle when coming onto a campus, something that's very unfamiliar to them and something that they never thought that they would ascertain, how do they begin to develop their, a different identity than an identity that um, is usually, that they don't have before? We call it being square, right? <laughs> so essentially, in this, in the educational environment, how does a student become square, essentially, but not lose who they are, essentially. And lastly, uh, Steele, he talks about the stereotype threat. Obviously, we know that um, there are certain stigmas that, that come with being, a, a, for example, an African-American male. It's just the reality of it. Um, I think back to the movie Higher Learning, 
Has anybody seen higher learning? And when uh, the woman was in the elevator, the white woman was in the elevator, and a black male walked in and she kind of clutched her purse at an educational campus. These are the type of things we're talking about. When a student, you know, is maybe aggressive in trying to get his point across in class, sometimes that comes off as he's a threat. Dr. Duke, get him out of my class immediately. I don't feel safe. And those are real statements that I hear, right? Um, so, you know, when we talk about the stereotype threat, that's what we're talking about, is how the student perceives themselves on campus and how we perceive the student when we receive it, right? So, the question I ask all the time is, is education a business, right? And I always come back to the answer of yes. These numbers aren't real. They're just made up in my mind, kind of easy math for me. So if we look at Cafe West as an example, let's say during weeks one and six of, 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 of the semester, um, we have all of our students. Cafe West is making $20,000 a week, right? While week six and seven, we experienced a drop of students before the W day. So now the revenue is down to 15,000 a week. But right before we get after midterms, right before finals, we experience another, another drop of students. So now Cafe West is only making 10,000 a week. From a business perspective, I'm pissed because my revenue is leaving. And we all know from a business perspective, it's easier to keep a customer than to go out and find a new customer. So that's the question. So is it easier to keep a student, or is it easier to go find new students? President Bill had mentioned that, that Santa Monica is desperate for students. Their students are leaving. They just happen to be coming to West um, to our benefit. But again, how hard is it for for, for college to capture new students every year if we're experiencing a mass exodus. 3,500 probably new students a semester. If we're experiencing maybe 1,250 of those students leave, how difficult is that to capture those students? And we're surrounded by a number of, college, a number of colleges looking for the same students. So, with that, there's implications. There's real implications um, with, some of the, with some of the legislation that's came down and put up on the, the institution, Senate Bill 1456, uh, getting students through orientation assessment and ed planning, um, which is tied to real dollars. Um, RITS for the college, which is tied to real dollars. Our outreach and recruitment. If we're losing 1,200 students a semester or a year, how much harder does our outreach department have to work to go get 1,200 more students, All right? Students not choosing to come to West, you know? All the time when students walk through campus, and I'll use DSPS as an example, because that's typically where I do my orientation of high school students, they say, we don't want to go to West. We want to go to Santa Monica. And I say, go to Santa Monica, you'll be here next year anyway. Mm -hmm. but, <laughs> no, but, but seriously, it's about what students hear about West. Well, that's a ghetto campus. That's where the kids from Crenshaw and Hamilton and um, Dorsey, that's where they go. I don't want to go there, right? So how do we change the face of that? Real implications on the economy. We put people to work. Through education, you put people to work. If students are in school, five times out of 10, they'll be in your house, right? Because in education, I think we save lives. And then also, what is our image to the community? This is what we say as a college mission. We say we provide a transformative education that fosters diversity 
for diverse learning, sorry, quality instruction, supportive services, but how are we communicating what we say we do? How are we communicating that to the organizations that we are involved with outside of the community? I just have a couple here. I'm not sure too much. Um, the 211, but I just thought it was a cool logo. <laughs> <laughs> um, but how, how are we telling the community organizations this is what we do, right? And, 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 and then they look at the data of our success rates and our graduation rates and our retention rates, and they see the 30, 40 percent of students being successful. It doesn't necessarily match up, right? So the question is, is equity always fair? And here's the illustration of, of equity, right? Everyone is on the same box, but then one person is a little bit shorter and can't see over the fence. So is equity, is equity fair, or are we really talking about social justice, right? And, and with the understanding that what we do for the population that suffers the most, everyone will benefit. And an example that I often tell is the curb cut. Before the curb cut was available, people who are in wheelchairs had to, lie, had to ride along the curb in the street. But now that we have a curb cut, they can get onto the sidewalk but at the airport, we will our suitcase right on the curb cut, right? So again, what we do for one, for, for, the, for the population of students that suffer the most, all can benefit. So these are some real questions, and I need, I need feedback on these questions. The first question is, and Rebecca, please don't answer, is does the college have an equity plan? Yes. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, when was it developed? No answer. <laughs> Anyone know when the equity plan was developed? Why? 2005. No one? 2005. It was a hint. I gave a hint earlier when it was developed. 2005. Nine years ago. <coughs> What year in the student equity plan was the date of mine? Do we know that one? 2003. <laughs> 11 years ago. <laughs> Personal question, rhetorical question, don't answer. When's the last time you reviewed the equity plan? <laughs> don't answer. That's the truth. The last, last question uh, is, <laughs> which department on campus is responsible by the chancellor's office definition for the equity plan. No, not counseling. Can I see that? I hear you. Academic affairs. Not academic affairs. Research and planning. Not financial aid. <laughs> nope. Student support and success programs. SSSP formally matriculation is is technically responsible for the equity plan. So uh, I pulled these two paragraphs off of the chancellor's, uh, off the chancellor's uh, webpage in terms of what is an equity plan. And I think it's important for us to know what is an equity plan and what are the elements of the equity plan because there's real money coming down to develop an equity plan. Um, so an equity plan focuses on increasing access, course completion, uh, degrees and certificates, um, it, identify, it identifies success indicators for disadvantaged populations. I would probably say underrepresented populations, but that's what they use. Um, and it talks about the, 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 the disproportionate impact on American Indians, Alaska Natives, Asian Pacific Islanders, Blacks, Whites, white men, women, persons with disabilities, and referenced by uh, the specific uh, code in Title V. Uh, but what I have kind of shadowed out in that sense is that each college develops specific goals, outcomes, and actions to address disparities that are discovered, disaggregating data for a few, four indicators by student demographics. So really what it's talking about is we need to, at the college, personalize an equity plan that works for us. Right? Um, Part of the equity plan um, is now the chancellor's office uh, has something that they call the scorecard. 
and the scorecard is public information and it displays our success rates at the college, right? So going back to tying into the community, if this data is available to the community and we want to be involved in the community, we have to either be prepared to, to answer the question, why are your success rates so low? And this one, I apologize for the small print. It looks like about 40, 48 um, percent in terms of student success. The next slide is um, 30, 30 something percent. And then, um, so we need to be prepared to answer those hard questions, or we need to be prepared to begin to do something about it, all right? So in talking to students, I, I asked them, I said, you know, what, is it, some, what are some of the things that you need on campus? And this is what they said, unedited. Um, consistent and reliable network of peers, faculty, and staff. Educational resources when the college is closed. Someone who is willing to assist in the development and success of that particular person. Um, someone who is dedicated and shows genuine commitment. More resources on campus to access. Giving us opportunity to utilize resources on campus. And educating us how to create more resources. And then the last one, I just pulled this paragraph right out and I'll read it to you. And you'll know it's not me. This person says, we don't realize how negative our situation is as black males. There are many more people telling us or telling what you're doing is whack, and not enough people telling you that you're doing a good job and keep going. Especially in times of failure, there's never enough encouragement to embrace the learning experience and keep going. That's what the student said here at West, right? I didn't. I don't even say whack, so. <laughs> no, it's not me. Um, but we are doing some things right here on campus. We are. We have a lot of technology um, that's assisting us in certain students. Uh, we develop some mobile applications. We have online advising for those students who aren't here on campus. Um, we develop a way uh, for an SSSP program for students to receive uh, what we're calling abbreviated ad plans, the first, the first semester here on campus. Uh, reliable Wi-Fi is, is in red, uh, sorry Michael, um, because uh, from what I hear from students is sometimes their Wi-Fi is reliable and sometimes it's not, all right? And when we're talking about the institution that fosters learning, you have to have access uh, to, to reliable internet connections. And in fact, I was reading yesterday that President Obama just released 750 billion to make that happen for, for, for K-12 and higher education. Um, accessible web pages. We have to uh, make sure our, our information is correct and readily available on our web pages, which we do. And then lastly, innovation. Um, I think we need to 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 leverage technology and, and be innovative and think outside the box. And by me saying think outside the box, really what I'm saying is that we're already in the box and we have to get out the box yeah. and <coughs> throw the box away and do something else. We have supportive programs here on campus, as you all, as, as you know, um, counseling, ELPS, DSPS, Transfer Center, Learn Program, TRIO, uh, tutoring, foster kinship care, um, tutoring at HLRC, our international student program, um, ASO and also our, our Puente programs, but really the real the real success and the real cost support is us in this room, right? This is the faculty, it's the staff, and the administration that comes to campus every day making it happen for students in the classroom and outside the classroom and in our supportive programs. So we can't lose sight of that at all. So, but we're saying that. <laughs> But we're saying that sometimes I think we take ourselves too seriously and, and we forget about what the end goal is. And the end goal, if we use uh, a track a track runner, a four by one relay, the end goal is to get the student to the end goal and get the students that exit points. And somewhere, and, and I have up there the word obstructionist in question mark because sometimes 
I, uh, I wonder, are we obstructions as professionals? Um, you know, at some point, as a student jogs around the track and is about to pass the baton on to, a, to, to another point here at the college, the, the baton drops. I'm not sure if it's because of something that we do kind of as an institution or just something that the student does. I would say it's probably a little bit of both, right? Two examples that I would give is, you know, are we making it very easy for students to receive education plans? You know, looking for the department chair. No, we're not. <laughs> I mean, we have, so we have to figure out a way to, to make it more accessible for students to receive education plans. On the other hand, how are we doing with students exiting math and English? It's a real question. So again, are we being obstructions? Are we are we providing the right exit points for, for, for AA degree certificate and certificates? Are we offering the right classes at the right times when students need the classes? And I mentioned before, as a college, I believe we save lives. But I think something is happening where we probably because historically in the way colleges are set up, we may be in the way of students being successful. And I think we should look at that. So, recommendations. Uh, so I want to leave time um, for, for questions and answers. Um, and these are recommendations that, that I've, I've researched some of the stuff that I just think is practical. But I think sometimes when recommendations are offered, they can't be too lofty where you have to have a meeting to figure it out, right? So we need to find a way to offer frequent academic counseling. All right. We need to look at course load and course taking patterns of our students. And in looking at those course loads and course taking patterns, we need to look at what are those meaningful courses and meaningful times that the students need those courses. Consistence of office hours and library hours. Um, as, as an institution, I believe we need to leverage technology. Um, we need to leverage the community. I think the community wants to be involved with the college, but doesn't know how to be involved with the college. Embrace diversity, truly. Um, and going back to the slide about taking ourselves too seriously, I think sometimes we get caught up in going to meetings, to meetings, to meetings, back to our office, to meetings, yes. turning emails, back to yes. our office, to meetings, that we forget to stop and say hello to the students that we're serving. All right? Really simple stuff. And the last thing, which is a, same, which is a shameless plug, uh -huh. <laughs> is to attend the event conference on March 6th. <laughs> <laughs> so, on the heels of this presentation, after uh, this afternoon, well, after this presentation, there is a student panel. Um, after the panel, uh, we break out into uh, discussion rooms uh, or discussion sessions. Um, and then this afternoon, the, there's a, um, a session on master plan here at the college. Uh, and these are the questions in, in your breakout sessions that you'll be you don't specifically have to answer these questions, but these questions just are there to guide the conversations. And the facilitators have those questions, so we won't spend time going over them. So, I said what I thought. Any questions? And, and, and uh, that I can answer any conversation. Again, I want to yield to some of the brightest individuals I know, uh, Dr. Jones, Dr. Foster, Mr. Green. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, he'll get his doctorate in about a year, <laughs> but until then, he's Mister. <laughs> any uh, any questions? Yeah, earlier in your presentation, you listed the various groups that may need extra consideration. I didn't say anything there about veterans, which is a growing group. Right. The presentation I was I was. I was really focused just on African American students. Of course, I could have thrown veterans or students with disabilities or some of our ESL learners. I could have, but I wanted to specific. I was asked to specifically focus on on African American students. But yes, it is it is a population that we do need to pay attention to.
question was, what is the AMEN conference? The conference is actually designed to work with practitioners and also with students on ways to actually be successful as African American students and also for the practitioners to understand the mechanisms that you need to use to, to work with our students. A lot of uh, folks, and we, we all come across this, a lot of our folks, are, you know, we, we work with students all the time, but of course there are different ways to approach different groups of students. And so one of the things we try to do during our breakout sessions is really try to get student, um, practitioners to understand that there are specific things and approaches that you can use that will really help outside of what Dr. Duke mentioned here as far as um, student engagement and other things, but just approaches that you can use, especially from a faculty perspective. The other part is that we also have inspirational speeches, speeches for our, our students who are there. So we usually have about, what, about 300 students, right? Something like that. Maybe 150, something like that, because there's, there's actually about 300 participants here in total, but maybe about 100 of those are students. And what we'll try to do is bring in speakers who are inspirational and also who are informative. So the conference itself is very inspirational, and it's, it's actually, you know, it's, it's life changing for a lot of students, it's life changing for a lot of people who are there. Is there a cost to it, or can we just The cost is, I think, 325 is that? $3.25? Yeah. <laughs> yes, for you it's $3.25. <laughs> Instructors, yeah, and people in Activia, um, classified. We, we, of course, since we all work with students, we're talking about administrators, faculty, staff. So what we'll do is this is each of the, uh, the, the breakout sessions are kind of done in strands. So we'll have a strand that's really designed for students, there's a strand that's designed for faculty, there's a strand, there's a strand designed specifically for administrators. Other questions? Anything about the conference? This year, one of our, our guest speakers is going to be Dr. Uh, Thomas Parham, who is the Vice Chancellor at UC Irvine. Awesome speaker. Awesome. Also, Sean Harper, who is an internationally known uh, uh, author and uh, a professor at University of Penn. University of Penn. University of Penn. Um, also, we have another gentleman by the name of <coughs> Brian Heat. Now he's an inspirational speaker. He'll be there the, the, on this on the Friday. And there's one other person I think we might have gotten um, uh, Friday. I'm not going to put that put that out there yet. This, it'll be a surprise. <laughs> Any other questions? Any comments? We're not just talking about black students, we're talking about Latino students, we're talking about all the other protected groups. And what I'd ask is, what do you think are some of the ways that we can do this? I mean, Dr. Duke pointed out something about changing the image of the college, to be more welcoming, I guess, to be more, I don't know, supportive? I don't even know if that's a symptom or if that's, a, that's an actual issue, but what do you all see as, as ways? And I know that you all, look, I know, I know that you're bright practitioners and you all have ideas. This is a safe environment, at least I think it is. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, it could be, it could be divisive. Right, what do you think? Well, I, I think, you know, as an instructor, um, I guess all my adult life and having worked with such a diverse range of populations, urban, rural, um, you, you name it, ages and every kind of, uh, disability that, that could be identified. What's disheartening to me sometimes, and I know it's something that we all face, 
is when you have such a promising student show up with incredible, you know, needs, but also determination, and you actually see them progress. And then all of a sudden they stop. And something's going on, which you may learn about later, either from them or from, so from someone else. And I'm thinking particularly of one student last semester. And she had to get an A complete because she didn't finish the research paper, but she had got an A on the final exam, <laughs> both parts. And I said, you know, please finish your, your research paper over the winter intercession so that you can go on to English 101 in the spring. She never got back to me. I ran into her on campus and, you know, she was with some friends. Believe me, we do a lot of reaching out here. And I'm, I'm not alone in this, I know this. And there was, there was just this gap that, you know, I couldn't reach across. And I think that's, you know, that's something I hope we really talk about today. Because we, we do reach out. I think a lot of us are thoroughly committed, incredibly dedicated. And, and there are some things that, that we come up against like that, and it really, it, it takes something out of you each time. So maybe, you know, there's, there's, there's a rich area for conversation there that I hope today we'll get to. I see a real connection between the leadership uh, retreat we had in November and this gathering today, and, and there's a real, you know, and that's part of the evidence of effort on the part of this institution that I think we ought to recognize and really uh, honor. And I'm hoping that today in our breakout groups we'll tackle the tough issues, the stuff that stops me in my tracks every once in a while, you know, and, and speak about those things that sometimes we don't get an opportunity to really bring out. And that's why I bring that example up because it really speaks to me. That's a great example. I know last year I was at the, uh, the Cal Works conference and I talked to CC about that and it was it was emotional. It was one of those things where you figure, you know, I walked in thinking, okay, this is going to be uplifting. I was I was sitting there getting misty. It was it was everyone was misty. It was just one of those things where the stories were so tragic at the same time they were so uplifting. But CC, just tell us what are some of the things that students experience that Cal, especially Cal Works students, what do they experience when they're when they're when they when just like Fanny described, you might see them they're doing good and suddenly. Well, first of all, the student comes to the campus because there are economic barriers are already there in place. Oftentimes, we generalize the CalWORKs person and all we see is welfare. But that person, as we see them today, because of the economy, we have, we have people that are, have been, had owned their own businesses. They've been doctors and lawyers in foreign countries and they're here as refugees. We have students that were at Spelman, uh, Howard, and now they find themselves back at the community college as parents, unemployed, and no resources. For them, when we look at CalWORKs, uh, I even noticed that for student support services, it's not mentioned. It is a strong student support service, and it's a very viable program on this, on this campus. The average student is probably spending about $2,500 in the bookstore every semester. Cash money, because it's coming from the county. It's not a credit card, it's not a check. It's real money. But when we look at the barriers, the biggest thing is the support services accessibility. Because there's a child care uh, inference there, maybe they did, can't make it to the final on time and the door is closed. There's no makeup. Or the, I'll, I'll give you an incomplete, but it's not explained to them what that process is. And most of us know, out of sight, out of mind, six months later, you're not thinking about the incomplete. Six months later, it's a fail. Or the drop process, a lot of things because they have so much on their plates. Uh, books. Books are a big issue for them. The cost of books. The county pays for their books, but now the county is saying, $400 for a chemistry book? Are you crazy? So the timelines. Uh, they don't, excuse me, they don't necessarily have the resources right now. It's a process that they go through. But supportive services, accessibility, how to contact that professor, getting the assistance that they need. Sometimes they can't get the book the first day. It takes them about five weeks, uh, I'm sorry, five business days to get their money from the county for a book. So being able to, where can I get that resource until I can get that book? Who can I speak to? Tutoring. Uh, we have tutors that we pay for.
that go to the library to assist students, but it's not enough. Or the days of the week. Uh, they're available on the weekends. Is tutoring in the library available on the weekend? Computer accessibility. A lot of them don't have computers at home. We, I, I'm uh, guilty of thinking that, oh, because they're so savvy with iPhones, et cetera, that makes them computer literate. They're not. Most of them, if you said, go to the website and pull up something about West LA College, they wouldn't be able to do it. They don't, they don't know what you're talking about because that's not an interest of theirs. So we have, to make, we have to be innovative in our ways to reach them, but particularly for the CalWORK students, we cannot shun them. They're, they're everyday people like the rest of us. Most of us are, are probably a month away from being in the same position. So I think we have to be able to invest time and interest in those students. That's for sure. Thank you. I, I know there's a lot of counselors here, too. And I know that <clears throat> you all deal with perception, too. And I think what happens is probably the, one of the things that's sticking points for a lot of students is just how to navigate this environment. But from the counseling perspective, for those counselors here, and please raise your hand if you're a counselor. Just one? Okay. More behind. <laughs> All right. From the counseling perspective, what do you see as some of the, some of the perceptions that students have? Um, <clears throat> do me in fact, be more specific. When well, you say when, they, when they say when they look at the college, they look at the college environment and how they act. What do they, what do they see? Okay. Um, from my from my experience, and I'm a novice to West Los Angeles, as this is only my second year here. Um, but from what I see. If I had to uh, speak on the perception of a student, I think things are brushed. And I don't always see myself being able to give the students, so I speak for myself personally, the attention that they may need. Um, it's one thing to ask for a service, but it's another when a student doesn't know how to ask for that service in a, in a edu in, with educational verbiage. So a lot of times, um, when I'm trying to advise the student, there's a lot of teachable moments at that time. Um, but uh, oftentimes, I, I'm one of those type of types of people. If I had it my way in a perfect world, I wouldn't want to walk around this campus and give everyone high fives and 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 smile and talk. But I notice sometimes the students are looking at me like, "Who's this? That, that's the guy that had to give me the bad news." And a lot of that bad news is based on not being prepared. Um, and so. I think for, for me, looking at these students, I, I want to be involved in helping them be prepared when they come in. Simple things, I, I can count the students that come and sit down for a counseling session without a pen and a piece of paper mm -hmm. to even record something. So I, if I give them, uh, where's, where's the, the room that I need to go to? It's a GC 160. Five minutes later, they've forgotten that. They don't have that recorded. And so it's just those types of teachable moments um, at, at any given time that I would like to have these students um, to, I would, I would wish, I'm wishing that these students would get because I think based on that lack of preparation, they feel rushed because they don't necessarily understand the process like some of us do. So I think um, it's, it's imperative that we all take our time, take our time. It can't be at our pace. Now, those of you who are instructors, raise your hand. Good to know. Question. Um, one of the things that I do, and I know we're mandated to write certain things in our syllabus that says that you have to get counseling or you, you can go here for disabilities, et cetera, et cetera. But I um, mandate the students to come in to see me individually uh, and during that time, can't catch everyone, talk to them about their concerns and refer them to other places if needed. All right, that's a great bridge too. I mean, that, that's, yeah. that's the bridge we're trying to get to. That was my next yeah. question, be my next okay. statement. <laughs> One of the things I find in class, and I'll tell you that a lot of the students almost seem afraid to succeed because they kind of think I'm not good enough. So I spend a lot of time on going through things and showing them what they already know and how to apply it to what we are currently talking about. And I, when I hear anything negative, I turn, I stop the class and I say, no, 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 no. And I make them see that uh, how they fit in and that they are not outside. 
it, it, it breaks my heart, frankly, because sometimes when I see the students, it's like they're standing outside, well, please invite me into the party. You are the party. That's what I try to get them to see. That uh, I start off the class by telling them, look, I love my subject, and I want you to love it. So I'm not going to put any roadblock in your way that make you feel like, oh, I'm not good enough, or I can't figure this out. Come on, let's, let's talk about it, and let's build upon what you already have, rather than just dump that all, and we got to start something brand new. Everything, I wanted to see that everything that they are taking supports everything else, every other class that they are taking. Right. All my students know my door is always open. I have tutored, you name it. That's the, the, the integrator approach works. It absolutely it does. And then they think, oh, now i got to go to that class. <laughs> well, it fits in with what you're already doing. That's, that's where the, the angle I always have come from. <coughs> Besides, I get excited about things. Here, here, and then here. Um, well, this is going to be my second semester here at West. But one of the things I've noticed across the line with other community colleges that I worked as an adjunct is really just getting down to empowering them, not enabling, because I had a lot of students that had the finger to launch, that they were scared to what's going to happen next. And really getting to know the campus and knowing the support services, but really taking away the stigma that they think they have, because they have grown up in a system. And it's like being respectful of that, but at the same time letting them know, but you're still powerful within the system that we created. Yeah, that, the, the two words get mixed up, empowerment and enabling. So yeah. I hear you. Um, as a student here, a lot of times um, we come across different professors. You have one professor that's like um, very open and willing to help you with everything. But then you'll go to another professor and they're not so willing. So then when they come across a professor like her and they're talking negative, she don't know she may have changed their lives. Right. But they don't know how to, how to go about it. Because as an African American, we are not taught to succeed. We are not taught to be better than what we, we've seen. So we just go each day and not try and do anything better than what we've done in high school or try to be higher than that. So that's how we, we come across as not knowing, but you never know enough. And most professors just see us as being um, not putting forth the effort, but we don't know how. We were never taught. Being, being pleased with being mediocre and just like yeah. kind of sliding under the radar. Yeah, I know that. I know that. Yeah, sometimes I think that um, we are, we don't know the frame of reference from which the student comes. And I think that, um, you know, I was thinking we need to give them a clear pathway of how they can succeed. But also it seems that we need orientation. That's mm -hmm. true. Um, you know, maybe the orientation of this faculty and for the students. No bad idea. Because I think that in my class, it's an average of 50, 35, 50. And uh, I have a lot of African American students, and you know, I do all of it. But my point is that it's a lot of the instructors who have need to examine their own ideals of students. In other words, as I tell my students, when their, I prefer, their, their mental model of what students are supposed to be like. As, yeah, as a, the first day of class, well, sometimes they teach the subject, but you teach the students. True. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I think um, I tell them the first day of class in my classes, and I love my students, is that, you know, my son failed this class, and I love him, so he's going to work with my parents. <laughs> <laughs> That's right, it's true. And I'm, I'm just saying, I think we <laughs> We have, we, have attitudes, we have attitudes that we don't realize we have. And our people, especially African, I can say from the African, we can pick that up. And our students pick it up. All students do. I think that uh, uh, Peter Senge had wrote a book called The Fifth Discipline, where he talked about people's mental models about how they perceive folks. And what you just said makes a lot of sense. Let me take one more comment. And comment. And this is basically a question. Do we have any numbers in the last six years since we have the Obama role model? As far as I know, I don't think that they, they, they we, I, this is the, the implementation phase, so they haven't really looked at numbers yet. So it'll be, it'll maybe 10 years from now, you might do that work. Well, because we want to be respectful of our student panel and give them their full time, uh, I would like to.
transition back to Professor Norris Bell. Um, but thank you for, for the time you gave me.